Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dave Deptula, AFA's uh, Dean of the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies. And this is Aerospace Nation, our conversational series examining the critical issues confronting the Department of the Air Force. Now, we're really pleased to have with us today, Lieutenant General Dave Nahom, Deputy Chief of Staff for Plans and Programs, also known as the Air Force A8. Abu, I hope that you and your staff and all the families are doing well. Uh, and uh, thanks so very much for taking the time uh, to do this. Um, to start off, how about giving us an overview of your thoughts on the most critical challenges uh, facing the Air Force's top programmer today? Oh, sir, well, th thanks, uh, thanks for having me here. And yeah, it's, uh, uh, and I, I, everyone's doing well. Uh, you can see the challenges. I'm sitting here at home right now. Um, you know, as, as most, we're uh, teleworking as much as we can. We flash into the Pentagon when needed, but uh, so it, it is challenging times. Um, you know, I, I would say right, you know, right off the bat, the COVID. Uh, if you look at the, uh, the challenges that that's presenting the Air Force right now, uh, there's many within the Air Force, not just our, our operational and our, our medical folks, but certainly our wing commanders out in the field that are dealing with this virus. Uh, and uh, my hats go, go to them every day. In the planning and programming world, you know, uh, you know we still, we're still looking to the future. We're not, not only the future we were talking about a few months ago, but uh, what may adjust based on COVID coming, coming out of this, uh, this tragedy that our, our country is going through. So we, we still are planning. Uh, we're still looking at uh, you know, what's gonna happen in 22, what's gonna happen in the next Palm, what's gonna happen with the next design, the, the design of the Air Force, uh, certainly uh, what, what the top lines look like. Um, you know, we, we were already planning on a relatively flat top line. Does that, does that actually hold? Or do we actually have to look at some uh, reduced budgets in the future? Uh, and how do we get after a design uh, with near peer competition uh, in mind, uh, get, uh, getting us towards the national defense strategy in the future? Well, very good. Before we get into some of the more specific programs that I know some in the audience are interested in hearing about, um, let me offer that as the Air Force programmer, you're faced with the challenge of trying to optimize limited resources for defense strategy that really requires more resources. So could you spend a couple of minutes in addressing your approach and in, uh, in meeting that really tough challenge? Well, sir, it, it is a tough ch challenge. And I'll, I'll say, you know, one, one of my deputies talks about uh, um, using his words, the, uh, the 2030 challenge. You know, for us in the Air Force, at Headquarters Air Force, and certainly me as the programmer, as we look at 2030 or a, you know, what, what, are, we de what are we designing to um, in pure competition? And we look at um, uh, out in the future, and because if you're going to design something for 2030, certainly we have to start planning for it, uh, paying for it, and uh, and building it, uh, start building it now. Uh, so that 2030 is always on our mind here in headquarters, Air Force, and certainly the A8. Um, if you ask the A3 down the hallway for me in the Pentagon, what's 2030 mean to him? He'll actually look at his watch and say that's 8:30 tonight. And I have the following operations going on, and so that. That difference, uh, and that, that is a tension, and it's not just with the A3, it's also with the combatant commanders, because there's certain things the, our Air Force must do uh, in today's challenges. Um, at, at the same time, we must also modernize for tomorrow's challenges, and there's not necessarily the resources for both. Uh, so that, that tug and the, those challenges are what, what keeps us very busy, because if we had enough money, it would be very simple. Uh, keep pouring money in current day operations and pour money in the, into modernization. Uh, but we're just going to have to find uh, that that sweet spot between the two uh, and balance that risk. Um, you know, one thing we did this year, you hear a lot about us moving a lot of money um, out of current op uh, current operations and taking some risk in, uh, in some of our platforms, as well as uh, moving airmen into more modern um, uh, ways of fighting. Uh, we, we say we moved over $30 billion. That's a fight up number. Um, and then you're, you're seeing the results of that, with the, whether it's um, uh, B1s, um, uh, reduction in B1s, you're looking at a reduction in A10s, you're looking at a reduction in the F15Cs in the future. There's uh, other platforms you're looking at because we have to use that money uh, now that we, so we can invest it now in the future. We're also talking about moving airmen. We initially were looking at almost 8,000 airmen moving them out of legacy um, platforms. Uh, as you go through OSD, uh, Program Budget Review, PBR, as you meet the risks uh, within this town, uh, that 8,000 is not quite as much now, uh, but we're still looking at making sure that we are 
not just moving into modern platforms, but we're moving our airmen into modern ways of fighting. Right. Here's a bit of a follow on uh, for you. Uh, given that the secretary and the chief have not backed away from the Air Force we need figure at 386 operational squadrons, what's the long term plan to reconcile uh, the resources that the Air Force has been allocated? Um, with what the Air Force actually needs to execute the national defense strategy. And related to that, who's out there advocating that the Air Force requires a bigger piece of the DOD budget pie to accomplish all the mission it's been assigned? Yeah, I, you know, the 386 is real and it's still there. And, and that really kind of set the foundation from where we're going now. And if you look, you know, if you listen to our chief talk about this, um, uh, General Goldfield will talk about, you know, in, in a in a conflict, whether it's in Europe or whether it's in the Pacific Theater or or anywhere else in the world, and you start looking at what's the demand on the Air Force, whether it's airlift or whether it's uh, close air support, whether it's ISR, uh, certainly with many of those um, uh, conflicts, you're also going to be looking at homeland defense, uh, strategic, uh, uh, posturing our strategic forces as well. You very quickly run out of Air Force. Uh, for what for what would need to happen in a very large scale um, uh, conflict, um, in, 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 even whether it's now or in, in ten years from now. Um, so if you look at where three eighty six number comes from, it's about getting the Air Force to the capacity that's necessary to meet the needs of our Air Force. Um, are we are we increasing the size right now? Not to the level we would like. We just don't have the top line to do it. Um, so we we are advocating um, as we always do to get the top line right so we can get the size of the Air Force correctly uh, to meet the challenges now and in the future. That said, we are also laying the foundation because it's not just about capacity, it's about capability. Um, and it's about um, uh, you know, moving uh, in, in the direction that the national defense strategy tells us to go for pure competition. Uh, and it's not just about numbers of fighters, it's about the right kind of fighters. It's not about numbers of bombers, it's the right kind of bombers um, and et cetera across the Air Force, as well as uh, the Joint All Domain Command and Control, uh, that I'm sure we'll talk about later on, uh, the air battle management system, and actually networking our, our systems the way that's going to be necessary in a modern fight. Well, oh, thanks very much for that. I, one thing I would uh, uh, offer, too, is a lot of people, or not a lot of people, but there's some people that are questioning, well, wait, why does the Air Force have this 386 number if we know that we're never going to get there? And uh, the response that I think, uh, at least I offer to them, is in, in it, that the 386 number um, is what used to be called the planning force. It, it's what's necessary. The programming force is the force that is designed relative to the budget constraints that have been placed on the Air Force. And if you measure the difference between the two of them, uh, you now get a, a, a solid understanding of risk. Uh, at least that's one way to look at, at, at risk in the context of the difference between what's programmed and what's necessary. Does that make sense? It does. And, and it really gets into balancing risk too. You know, there, you know, you, you hear um, uh, folks talk about the tanker force and growing to a certain number of tankers. Well, that would be, that would be true in a, in a uh, Air Force of 386. But since we're, we know we can't get to 386 in current top lines, we have to balance that risk. And we're not going to be able to get to the, the, right. the number of actors we want or the number of bombers we want or the number of fighter squadrons we want. Um, we're just going to have to make sure that we, we balance that risk level and as, as we do right now. Well, that's why they pay you the big bucks. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's move on a bit. Uh, the AFWIC, or the Air Force Warfighting Integration Capability, is making plans for the future of the Air Force. At the same time, and you, you alluded to this, the major commands as well as the combatant commands have established their requirements for fleet size and systems that they'd like to acquire and or retain. So explain a little bit on what the AH role is in planning uh, the future of the Air Force. And are, are you kind of acting as a referee among the various competing inputs? Yeah, I would say uh, a referee is an interesting way to put it, but... Uh... You know, um, the uh, you know, AFWIC is, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about AFWIC in a second, but when I look to AFWIC, I really look at the, the what, what we need as an Air Force, our Air Force design, and the why, why we need it uh, to meet the, the threats, uh, how we're going to enter joint partners, how we're going to integrate with our allies. They're going to define the what. Um, the A8 is the how. 
Um, and very often the how does become a referee because there's, there's not enough resources, both in manpower and money, uh, to do all the things that we know we, we should do uh, as an Air Force um, and, and invest in the ways we should invest. Um, AFWIC has been, been great. Um, I know it's not uh, the Air Force warfighter integration capability. I know it's not exactly what was initially envisioned, um, but I think right now it is it, uh, what, the way they've established themselves has been excellent. Uh, and I, I really look forward to how we further develop it going forward because prior to this, when we had the core function, the core functions uh, spread amongst uh, MAGCOMs, they did a wonderful job in their, um, in their core function, making sure that those were developed. The problem was there wasn't a, a metering function in the Air Force. So, um, you know, if we're going to build a tanker that has a certain refueling capacity, you know, maybe we didn't need to build a fire, fighter with a certain amount of range. And, you know, who, who in the Air Force was actually deciding uh, where to meter those capabilities? And it really wasn't happening uh, at the levels we would like. Uh, AFWIC allows that to happen now. You know, if we're going to, if, if, uh, if uh, we're going to invest in a certain type of weapon, well, maybe we don't need as many bombers. Or if we're going to, um, we're going to save money on weapons, maybe we need more bombers. You know, they're the ones who are going to decide that. And so when people come to me and they say, well, here, I got this great idea. Uh, I, I always ask them, you know, what does Fan Man think or what does Q think, you know, General Fantini or General Hino uh, in AFWIC because, you know, I want to know how that fits into the Air Force design and it's not, you know, can we invest in it, should we invest in it uh, and at what levels. And, um, and they've certainly been helpful along the way with that. Yeah, uh, again, I'm, I'm smiling because I'm thinking back uh, to the days when I was on active duty and the discussion with the, the, the core function areas uh, came about uh, and um, uh, the move to a much more integrated approach, uh, I think, is one that has benefited the Air Force well. Now, no, think I, hit, go ahead. I, was, I would say I don't want to minimize what the, the MAGCOMs as, in their role as the lead MAGCOM for these systems. Sure. Because they're the ones, are, they're the experts in how we're going to maintain, develop, and uh, further these systems. Uh, we just, you know, um, if we just look at the bomber roadmap or the fighter roadmap or the ISR flight plan or, you know, you take each one of those individually, and then if you add them all together in aggregate, they're just not affordable. Uh, so that that's where the that's where the tug and that's where Apple has been very useful uh, to very 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 much methodically look at this and and help us design what the Air Force should look like. And then the, where the eight comes in, I say given the given the constraints of resources. Right. Thinking ahead, uh, the next couple of budget cycles. Um, and you sort of already alluded to this, uh, it's highly likely that the Department of Defense top line is going to remain flat or decrease. And frankly, given all the uh, spending uh, in response to uh, COVID-19, it's most likely going to decrease. Assuming that that's the case, isn't there a need for a cross-service review uh, to start looking at uh, reducing the potential for excessive overlap uh, across the services in some mission areas? For example, a review of future long-range strike investment, uh, given that all the services are now investing in new standoff weapons. Yeah, and I, and I, we, I agree with the flat, um, and probably not, um, uh, uh, and probably not adjusting for inflation either. So, in real buying power, I see, I, I see, um, with, without COVID, without all the the money we're we're now as a as a country having to spend on stimulus to get our economy back. Without that in mind, we were still expecting a flat and relatively declining buying power uh, in the future. We were already planning to that. Um, I, I do think that we, we as a, a DOD and the Air Force has to be part of this conversation, have to look at uh, duplicate activities um, and see where there is some trade space because um, you, know, when, when you, you bring up the long range fires uh, and that, that, that's just one of them. And I, and I know uh, DOD and certainly CAPE uh, and our partners down there, they are looking at this because uh, because I think it's uh, if uh, the Air Force can do something a long range strike, maybe one of their services doesn't have to do it. But all of us uh, investing in a, in, a, in a single area, um, in uh, uh, just in a slightly different way, uh, it's just not going to be affordable, especially uh, if those flat um, budgets that you talk about actually become uh, less than flat. Now, a related way um, that um, we've talked about before to compensate a bit for the Air Force not getting all the resources that it needs is to accelerate uh, foreign military uh, sales uh, and, and work with our, our, our partners and allies, as well as a way uh, to bolster our industrial base. Um, what, what are your thoughts in this regard? Yeah, I mean, I, 
I, I agree because you know you you know it's kind of in that last conversation with long range fires. You know, there's always a discussion about the inside force and the outside force, and, you know, long range fires versus a, a penetrating force and all that discussion. Well, we have the ultimate inside force um, in both Europe and the Pacific. It's, it's our allies. I mean, they're there and, uh, and they, you know, and I would say um, in, a, in a perfect test, a perfect case of this is what the F-35 brings. Um, you, you have a, a, the, the top uh, fighter platform and many of our allies in key locations around the world are flying that and have the ability to integrate with us in ways that we've never seen before. Um, so I, I think we're, we're very well set up uh, for that, that poor military sales piece, not only assisting in our defense industrial base, but as well as giving us that inside force and that, uh, and that edge we're gonna need, certainly in a Pacific conflict. And if you think of the countries flying the F-35 in the Pacific now and the ones that are likely to expand to it, and then you go into Europe uh, with our NATO allies and all our, 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 partner, our partners in the F-35, um, I think uh, we, we're, we're very well set up for the future. And I think, I think that's one of the ways uh, that you're going to see us uh, keep our edge over any, uh, any peer competitors out there. Um, during, uh, let me turn, uh, shift gears just a little bit here um, and talk about space a bit. Uh, during uh, Chief Raymond's uh, interview last uh, Tuesday, he outlined a lean space force uh, that's agile in their acquisition processes and has a somewhat constrained number of personnel. Uh, all of that implies a bit of a resource dependency on the Air Force, um, which is understandable as the Space Force continues its path to maturity. Um, so how are you accounting for this resource dependency in your planning and programming structure? Uh, could you say a couple of words about how it might evolve? And where, if any, do you see definition uh, still unfolding? Uh, and uh, what kind of cultural mindset uh, do Department of the Air Force personnel need to uh, adapt to when dealing with this uh, bit of division within the Department of the Air Force? Yeah, you know, right now it's, uh, I would say, uh, uh, it's great hearing Chief Raymond's words on this. Um, you know, we had such good partnership with our, our, our you know, the space side um, prior to uh, the Space Force, and, and that hasn't changed, which has been phenomenal. Uh, I, I think it's an exciting time. Uh, to watch uh, the Space Force develop. And, you know, it, it is a sixth branch of our military. It's not the second branch of the Air Force. Um, and so they are, there is some independence there, and that's, that's a good thing. Uh, in, my, in my world, we're, we're, right now we're starting out a little bit um, like the, the Department of Navy is, where you actually have a, a top line comes into the Department of the Navy and then a split between the Marines and the Navy, even though very, very often it was predetermined. We're tr treating our same way with my space counterparts right now. The one thing I think we've got to be careful is, you know, we know space needs to grow. Um, you know, if you look at yep. what a peer, a peer fight would look like 10 years from now, the capabilities we're going to need, uh, our, the joint force, the combined force is going to need uh, from space are just going to grow and increase. Um, that growth cannot be only at the expense of the Air Force, because the problem is, as we, just, we talked about previously, the Air Force needs to grow and needs to develop as well. So I think that is gonna be a challenge for the Department of Defense. Uh, and we are working very closely with our, with our friends down in Cape uh, and, and within OSD uh, to make sure we get the, uh, we, we have the right division now, which I think we have a, a pretty good start, uh, but then we work very closely to make sure that uh, space can grow. Uh, and then it, it's not at the expense of the things that combatant commanders in the future are gonna need from their Air Force because they're, they're, we have to be mindful of that as well. Okay. Let's shift to address some of the more specific areas of interest that are out there. Uh, ABMS, uh, JAD C2 is about data and its distribution first and platform second. However, in the current DOD programming system, uh, it's very much a platform centered business. Um, would an alternative approach such as uh, mission integration management help alleviate these issues and assist the Air Force and DOD uh, to better communicate the critical importance of information sharing, which actually is the fundamental basis um, for the advanced uh, uh, battle management system and uh, joint all domain command and control. And, and how would that work in practice? I, you know, I think right now, I, I think our, uh, our, as we move forward with joint all domain command and control and certainly the, uh, the heartbeat behind the your battle management system, I think the conversation is going well. Um, you know, six, eight months ago, it was a very tough conversation within OSD. Uh, and I think uh, you know, Chief Goldfein and certainly uh, on our uh, SAF AQ side, led by our architect, uh, Preston Dunlop, 
uh, General Kumashiro and his team, uh, they've really brought this conversation out and they've got a lot of people buying into what this, what this, what this means uh, by bringing um, uh, data to the forefront. Um, I'll tell you, it's always going to be a tough sell because you're talking about trading and um, using the Chiefs word, you're talking about trading in a lot of trucks in this town uh, and people like trucks in this town. Uh, and you're trying to buy, you're trying to build, buy and build a highway. There's not a lot of people advocating for buying and building highways um, uh, in, in the matter we're, we're talking about. Uh, so I think it's always going to be a tough sell. Uh, I think we have to have this conversation. Yeah, you know, you, you take a future battlefield, take a place like Syria to pick your place right now where you have F-35s flying overhead and you maybe have a, uh, a special ops unit directly below those F-35s. Those F-35s are bringing in data and information at a level that no other airplane on Earth has ever been able to do. Um, how do I get to, how do we get to a point where we can share that information with that special ops team directly below that airplane at machine speeds? Uh, and we need to build that infrastructure uh, that, that allows for that. I think we, we are on, we're on our way to do it. We have to continue to talk about it and continue to show that if you're, we're gonna be relevant in a peer fight with a very robust uh, air defense system, we're not going to do it by flying uh, um, just solely by flying airline looking airplanes with sensors on into the battlefield. It's just, it's just not going to work that way. Uh, and this is a huge conversation, not just with the air, this certainly just brings in our space friends, as well as Navy, and Marines, Army, everyone, because everyone has a sensor out there. And how do we loop them all in? So we not only share data, but we share data at, uh, at, shot, quality, uh, at shot quality levels where any sensor, any shooter, any node, it, it truly takes place. I think, I actually think we've laid the foundation this year and I, I'm looking forward to next year uh, to continue on. Well, uh, it, it's good to hear all of that. Um, I'd agree with you. Um, it's taken quite a while, but uh, uh, you, you kind of alluded to it in the context, the other services are now getting on board, but building mm -hmm. sort of a, what, what some have called the combat cloud where information uh, needs to be shared in a ubiquitous and seamless fashion is, is key, not just only to uh, improving our ability to operate, but it gives us uh, what I think ultimately will become uh, a, a, a critical uh, conventional deterrent because an adversary can punch into this cloud and even if they take out parts and pieces uh, because it can self-form and self-heal, it's really hard to defeat the whole thing. Um, so that's a, it's, it's great to hear that uh, the other services are, are getting on board as well. Sure. Um, with the decision to shut down a production of MQ-9s, this is another area that people are, are concerned and interested about. Maybe you can shed some light on it. And that planned retirement of a, as well, a planned retirement of a significant portion of the uh, Global Hawk fleet it seems to some like the Air Force has taken a strategic pause uh, in respect to unmanned aircraft development and procurement. Could you speak a bit to the uh, Air Force's current um, remotely piloted and autonomous aircraft flight plan and you know, what kind of UAVs are the Air Force looking to acquire in years to come and how do you uh, envision the missions of currently deployed UAVs to change in the future? Yeah, it's going to, you know, it's obviously really hard in an unclass environment to get into too much with the ISR piece, but we have a very robust plan to modernize our, our ISR uh, in, way, in ways that can feed into an air battle management system that allows us to do what we need to do in a pure competition. Uh, that said, the MQ-9 is a valuable asset. Uh, we're not walking away from the MQ-9 business. We have a lot of platforms. We have plenty of platforms to carry us on for the uh, several years to come. Um, but we do need to reduce the size of that fleet slightly uh, in the near term. Uh, one of the, well, I'll tell you, one of, the, one of the reasons, if you look at the way we do ISR, especially the MQ-9, they're very manpower intensive ways to do business. Uh, and we need to repurpose that manpower into other things in our Air Force because that, that's one of our, uh, that is our most valuable asset. Um, and um, so obviously we're, we're looking at that. Now, will we, will we still do unmanned systems even in low end conflict like we use in MQ-9? Yes. But maybe it's not an MQ-9. There's other technologies out there that we we need to start exploring, uh, and this is a way for us to work very closely, not just with uh, the combatant commands that are using these assets right now, but with other intelligence agencies on, on different ways we can do some of these things that are potentially cheaper uh, and definitely uh, less manpower intensive, 
and allows us to uh, use some of that in, uh, investment for for the high end five. Frankly, uh, the RQ4 same. Um, you know, we are we have we have uh, we have a definite direction we're going with ISR. Uh, there's parts of the RQ4 that we're going to be hanging on to, uh, specifically the Lock 40s, and parts of it we're going to look to divest um, in the near term, uh, so we can use that that resource and that manpower for modern ways of doing um, uh, ISR. Um, speaking to the future, uh, how much confidence is there that the next generation air dominance program or NGAD um, will uh, progress? And uh, what's the risk to that program uh, due to those uh, tighter budgets that uh, we know are, are coming? Um, obviously, this is a critical question uh, of uh, interest for the uh, aerospace industry. Yeah, right now, I mean, there the, the NGAD program has to proceed forward. As, as, you know, if you look at, the, and again, and what, just like the ISR, one of these tough conversations in an open mind. Um, but when you start look, talking about the next generation, what does air dominance look like? What are the technologies we need to bring to bear? Uh, whether it's a manned, unmanned platform or whether it's technologies and other platforms, we don't know exactly what that's going to look like. We have some ideas. We're moving forward on them. Uh, that investment, um, we, we are going to make every attempt to make sure that stays where it is because we do believe that any joint force in the future is going to need the Air Force to be able to ensure freedom of maneuver. Uh, and certainly the platforms and the technologies uh, that we're going to need in an A to AD environment in 2030 may not be what we're flying right now. Uh, that That's not uh, uh, anything against any of the platforms you're flying, F-22, F-35, B-2, anything. Uh, but uh, there's other technologies we need to bring to bear. Um, and if you start thinking 10 years out, uh, and, and if we're going to do this, now is the time. Uh, we don't need to wait uh, eight, 10 years and then um, realize we've lost air dominance. We've lost air superiority in, uh, at a time, place of our choosing, and then have to, to look at it. So now is the time to study uh, and invest uh, in what that looks like um, several years in the future. Okay, to get most out of the... Air Force uh, to uh, get it to where it needs to go, uh, tankers are a necessity. Uh, and they're also one of the largest recommended growth areas in the Air Force We Need plan. Um, can you give us in the audience an update on the status of a KC-46 acquisition and looking beyond the KC-46, uh, tell us a little bit about your thinking on requirements for a future tanker. Are we looking at, for example, uh, unmanned or optionally manned tankers in the future? There, you know, we're, ju we're just starting to look at what's what's next past KC-46. Right now, from my from my my foxhole is I need to get KC-46 uh, um, online. Um, you know, we, we really, if you look at the resources available, um, we, we do need to get to a two tanker fleet. And uh, in the near term, that is a KC-46 and a, and a KC, a modernized KC-135. Um, and so, if you, and that, that the, uh, you notice I didn't say KC-10. Um, the KC-10 is a wonderful, anyone who's flown the KC-10 or refueled behind a KC-10 knows what a wonderful airplane it is. Uh, but the three tanker fleet would be very, very difficult for us to afford. Um, and uh, so we will work the KC-10s out of service in the next few years, making room for the 46, uh, as well as keeping many of the 135s around. The 146 with the uh, remote visual system has been a challenge. Uh, we've had some really good news lately with um, some of the agreements between the Air Force and Boeing on the fix. We think we're on the path for a good fix here coming up in the next few years. We're very excited about it. We think we need to keep accepting them and keep transitioning units so we can keep that. Um, uh, um, so when the fix is ready, we can um, get, get that into the airplanes and be ready to go with the KC-46. And we're, we're proceeding down that road right now. Um, there is nothing more critical than the refueling uh, in terms of getting to the fight. Uh, and then sustaining the fight. And, and we know that, um, and I tell you, this is, this goes back to that 2030 discussion I had. You talk about a, right. you know, we know we need to modernize the tanker fleet. We know the KC-46 is the future, but the transcom commander and the other combat commanders rely on the KC-10 or the KC-135 and its current size uh, fleet right now. Um, those, those two things are definitely a, a, is a challenge and we've been working very closely with transcom to make sure we get that mix right. Um, and I'll tell you, it's a, uh, this is one of the harder things we had to do this year was to make sure that we were uh, working very closely with the combat commanders to divest the right amount of tankers. So not only free up the resources, but free up the manning. You know, when it, just like when a fighter unit, uh, you, you, you pick a, the uh, platform, when they're gonna come into a new location, uh, not only do uh, um, 
I need the money for the new, the new platform for weapon system sustainment, flying hours, et cetera. I need the parking, I need the ramp, and I need the people because the, you know, the people uh, that were, we're flying the old airplane now need to fly the new airplane. Um, if you got to hang on to the old airplane, I got to find more people. And, and that's a very hard thing to find right now. And so uh, it's a challenge. Uh, and, uh, and so we, we cannot get that fixed fast enough. Um, and then get the KC-46, I'll tell you, it's a wonderful airplane. And uh, you talk to those who've flown it, I think when we get that airplane for what it can do, not only in the air fueling with some of the other missions um, uh, for the, uh, the cargo, as well as some of the aeromedical evacuation other missions, it's just gonna be a wonderful airplane, a wonderful addition to our Air Force. Well, um, I guess you're pretty happy to hear that uh, Boeing uh, started production back up, uh, they, sure. I think this last week, uh, given um, all the, the complexities that COVID-19 added, but uh, uh, that was a, a good news to uh, everybody uh, who understands the importance of air refueling. Yes, sir. Um, so, General Nahum, where do things stand now with the B-21 program? Uh, you and uh, other Air Force leaders have recently testified that there's a need for a future force of at least 220 bombers. Uh, but right now, that force is on a path to about 140 total in the early 2020s. Um, once this development is complete, um, could the B-21 actually be accelerated to help fill that gap? Well, I'll tell you, the, the, the bomber fleet, is a, it, it actually mirrors the tanker fleet a little bit. You know, we, we've got, right now, um, we have uh, three bombers, the B-1, B-2, and the B-52. Pretty soon, we're going to have four, but the B-21, when the first one comes off the line, uh, we've got to get to a two bomber fleet uh, and the future of the bomber and, the, and uh, is the B, uh, a, mo a very modified B-52 and the B-21. How we do that over the next 10 years is going to be the trick uh, because we've got it, we've got it right now, you, the combatant commanders rely on what the bombers bring to the fight and what they bring is volume of fires. Uh, and the B-2 also kind of uh, the ability to penetrate into uh, enemy air defense systems, but the, the volume of fires piece, nothing else matches. We, we don't get it. We don't. We in the Air Force, we don't get any help from our joint partners on bombers, and we don't get any help from our coalition partners. You want a bomber, you have to go to the U.S. Air Force, uh, and what a B-1 brings to the fight is unmatched. Um, but at some point, we're going to need to get the B-1s out of service so we can make room for the B-21s. The first step in that was this year's budget when you see us reducing the, B, the B-1 fleet by 17. That doesn't mean there's any more reductions in, in, in the work. Right now, our, our plan is to slightly reduce the B-1 fleet and then let that, let that slightly reduced fleet extend out to shake hands with the B-21. Um, the B-1 we've flown very hard over the last several years. And um, uh, there's many of those airplanes that are, that are to a point where they'd be, be so expensive to repair that that would crowd out uh, investment in some of the other airplanes. So what you're seeing at Dias and um, uh, and up at Ellsworth is you're seeing the, ma the maintenance force stay in the same size and you're going to see a slight reduction in airplanes so we can concentrate on the airplanes that will be easier to maintain and then carry that bomber force into, into the future till we, till we get a B-21. That, that reduction has allowed us uh, some, some uh, maneuver for the bomber force. It allowed us to make sure we keep the B-21 on track and then we, we do have future plans to look at accelerating um, and that, that's something we'll talk about after we get the first ones, uh, get the first ones flying. It also allows to make sure we keep the B-52 on track. Um, the SERP, the uh, civilian engine um, uh, uh, refer program on the, on the B-52, as well as the radar modernization program, r &P. Uh, these, these are very important things if you want to keep the B-52 uh, uh, viable into a, a 2030 and beyond uh, type scenario, and, and which we intend to do. So we want to make sure those programs are well funded, as well as it um, allows us to make sure we continue to uh, develop and test the, uh, the B-21. It's, it's, just, it's, it's just starting production, uh, just starting production and going into test pretty soon here. Um, so I, I, there's good news on the horizon for the bomber force. I think we have to watch it closely. Um, the, you know, we need B-2s to stay around until we can have B B-21s because we have, to, we have to be able to offer our nation ability to, uh, to penetrate enemy air defenses with, with a bomber. And, uh, and that right now is a B-2. And then certainly, certainly very soon in the future, there'll be a B-21. We just want to make sure that we, we, we have that ability to do that all the time, not only in the current fight, but in the future fight. Well, the logic to, that you've laid out, um, it, given the fact that um, the, the services uh, are issued uh, specific budgets that they have to deal with, um, makes some good sense. 
Um, this kind of goes back to an earlier question I had in the context of looking across the services. I mean, given the fact that, you know, two B1s can deliver the entire carrier, or the entire ordinance delivery capacity as an entire carrier battle group in some situations, you know, we, once we start looking cross service, uh, those kinds of elements need to come into play. Now, I fully understand that, you know, you can't do that right now, but understanding the logic that you've laid out, what happens if, uh, well, let me just ask you this, if, if there are unforeseen B21 program issues that might come up, um, could that increase the need to fund additional B2 modernization or reconsideration of uh, B1 retention? Um, and one other related question, are the proposals that are out there we just saw recently to retain B1s in the force as missile carriers, um, uh, is that option considered or being considered for uh, resourcing? It, it is, and, and you're absolutely right. We, we have to stay flexible. If, um, you know, you know, I know, I know the date that we're thinking the, B, the B1s would leave service, but you know, I, I know the reality of development of new programs. And I'm sure the B21 is going to have uh, have those bumps along the way. They all do. We'll, we'll work through them uh, with, with the uh, the manufacturer. Uh, but we know, um, you know, the, uh, the right now we have a bit of a best case on the timing, and we know we're going to have to adjust going forward. And that goes, you know, if you look at some of the offsets we took with B2 modernization, we we just have to. We just don't have the money. We, we all the money we need. And so the um, uh, but we know we're going to need to adjust. Um, along the way, and we're, we're certainly working very closely with Global Strike, um, and uh, to make sure that we we get this uh, we get this right going forward. In a perfect world, um, uh, in, in uh, uh, about two five ups from now, we'll have B21s filling out the squadrons, we'll have B1s uh, gracefully retiring, uh, and then very soon after that, the B2s gracefully retiring, and that that's a perfect world. And then in a very perfect world, we would get to 220 bombers because we know that part of the Air Force we need, and we know. If you look at what a combatant commander would want from an Air Force in a future fight, they're going to want 220 bombers, um, and that that is going to be a uh, that, that's going to be a you know given the, the budget discussion we had, that's going to be a tough one to get to, but that is our goal. We're going to try to get there. Uh, here's another one that's uh, uh, obviously generating a lot of interest, and that's the Air Force's uh, FY21 budget uh, seeks to reduce the A10 inventory. Uh, but uh, concurrently investing in upgrades for the remaining A-10s. And um, would you describe how this impacts the total net uh, capacity to conduct close air support um, while recognizing that with precision weapons, uh, aircraft like the B-1, F-15E, F-16, and others can play a major role in this mission area? Yeah, I'll tell you, that's, you know, the A-10 is an incredible airplane. It, it is now and it will be in the future. Um, I don't think anyone, I think it first flew in 75. I don't think anyone ever thought we're talking about um, A-10s into 2040, you know, back then. Uh, but I'll tell you, it brings something to the battlefield that no, nothing else brings. It brings a very cost-effective way to get at, um, uh, get at close air support, especially in permissive um, and lightly contested environments. That said, close air support in the future is not going to always be in lightly contested environments. Um, and we need to bring on platforms and um, weapons uh, that can do close air support when um, a, uh, a threat nation brings in a, a double-digit um, system. Uh, and that, that is why we have F-35s, and that is why we have uh, other weapons we're bringing on board that can, that can handle that environment. Um, with that, though, there's places like Afghanistan that I don't necessarily want to send F-35s. Uh, we'd rather have F-35s training and doing things they're doing right now. Uh, um, and so... Uh, keeping uh, enough A-10s around that we will have the ability to keep them on the road. And if you look at what we're doing, we did a lot of analysis of how many to keep. Um, we know we're going to keep them in Korea for a little bit. Um, and we also know that we would actually like to have the ability to give a combatant commander one A-10 squad on the road all the time. So what does that fleet size look like? And that's where we actually looked at coming back from nine operational squadrons down to seven. Um, seven, we think, is a sweet spot. Uh, that's three active duty, three guard, one reserve squadron operational, and uh, that gives you and your your and your uh, test training and WIC. Um, most of most of that down in Davis Month and uh, going into the future, that reducing the A10 size over two years by 63 airplanes offers us a lot of money that we can now one invest into the A10. We make sure we have the wings and all these structural things we need to do with that airplane, 
as well as the avionics um, and uh, to make sure that it can, it can uh, integrate into a, a, a digital battlefield of the future. And we have those investments all paid for and ready to go. And so that, that is the, uh, the long-term plan for the A-10. We think it's got a big place. You know, we have to modernize. And I'll tell you, one of the hardest things is the people. You know, th those two squadrons that, that are divesting, th th those airmen aren't going away. Uh, they're right. going to be flying and, and working on other airplanes, um, most notably the, um, the F-35. I mean, at the same time we're doing this, this adjustment to the A-10, we're also bringing two uh, additional um, F-35 squadrons where there was no squadrons before up in, up in Alaska, or an additional fighter squadron out at Lake Eight. Uh, and now you're talking about 10 to the three squadrons. I, we, we have to find the manpower uh, as well. And this is a big part of that as we modernize as an Air Force. But that being said, there is no more efficient platform in a low-end fight. And that, that includes propeller-driven uh, light attack type platforms. The most efficient way you can get out these low-end fights and with the most firepower, especially with that, you know, that beautiful gun on the phone, is the A-10. Uh, and that's why we think uh, keeping the, keep, not only keeping it, but making sure we get the, the size of that fleet correct. And, uh, and that's what we're working towards as an Air Force. Well, that's a great segue to my next question for you, because meanwhile, um, Special Operations Command is moving forward with its armed overwatch plan. Uh, so what's the status of the Air Force's lead attack experiment? And is it going to be turned over to SOCOM? Uh, and is the Air Force going to have an active role in SOCOM's program, but funded through uh, SOCOM lines? What's, what's the deal with a light attack? Yeah, you know, it's interesting, you know, light attack and SOCOM, that, that was never the, the armed overwatch piece, that was never the intention of that program. You know, that, that light attack started with allies and partners in mind. And that, that's really how it started. And that's really where uh, Joe Goldfein's uh, uh, mind has been with that program all along. Um, and, you know, can we develop a, a low cost aircraft uh, that um, uh, other air forces that may not have the bankroll for, um, for uh, high end fighters could, could fly? And could we integrate with them? Could we build an integration system? That's what you're seeing with Aeromet, where not only could we as a U.S. Air Force integrate with them, but maybe they could integrate some of their other platforms they have, because many of these countries have um, uh, various platforms out there. And could you find a low cost way? as well as a uh, low cost of entry in terms of the classification where you could really, uh, really sell this to uh, just about anybody out there that we're working with. Um, we as an Air Force think we need to continue experimenting with light attack and experimenting with that allies and partner angle and maybe expanding it to other areas, maybe some low cost jet aircraft and other things that we really want to look at. What comes out of a light attack experiment when you have that focus is not necessarily what our special operating uh, operations partners need for, for a, um, uh, a armed overwatch platform. Those things, what we're finding is we're producing two different types of platforms. And so what we worked very closely with SOCOM, I spent um, many hours on the phone with my, uh, my counterpart uh, down in Tampa, Gerald Bolthy and the SOCOM commander talked several times on this. We made sure that we were, we were absolutely uh, working directly with them that, you know, could we actually move some Air Force money into SOCOM? and let them develop an armed overwatch platform that they need. And this is not for replacing A-10s in a place like Afghanistan. This is for where SOCOM operates very often in places where the U.S. Air Force isn't around. You know, think Central Africa or think places uh, far away from a normal battlefield area that we're not normally at. And could they, could they develop a platform that could be op operated from austere locations, give them, a, give them a, an extended amount of um, uh, persistence overhead, and even offer some, um, uh, some firepower when needed? Uh, for that armed overwatch piece. Uh, that's not necessarily what comes out of a light attack uh, program. So what we did this year, which I, I'm, I'm very happy with, is we split those out. We split out the, the armed overwatch piece to the special ops, and then we let the, the light attack experiment, which is still taking place uh, in a very small scale, very inexpensively at Nellis, and a piece of it down at Hurlburt uh, with our, um, our, uh, our mission down there, uh, and let us continue on. Let us continue experimenting. Let us continue working with allies. Let us continue working with Aeronet. And then look at how we expand that program out. And at the same time, move some Air Force TOA over into SOCOM and let them develop the armed overwatch platform that they need to protect their special operators who, again, are off, often very far away from where the U.S. Air Force is in the world. Well, thanks very much for that uh, great uh, rundown, uh, General Nahum. I mean, all the way from uh, space to tankers, to B1s, uh, to fighter, uh, to readiness. Um, you, you have an enormous portfolio. 
uh, and uh, the Air Force Association and the Mitchell Institute in particular, wish you all the best in this era of uh, ever increasing challenges. Thanks again. Thanks, sir.